introduce uh, Felipe Sandoval, who's a world-renowned expert in aquaculture, especially that focus on salmon. He's come all the way to give this talk from Chile, came yesterday, and leaves, I think, this evening. So thank you so much for I, I took the trip recently, and it's very difficult, and you're, you're a tough man. Um, uh, Mr. Sandoval is the president of what's called Salmon Chile, which is an industry, industry-based organization um, that a, a collection of the biggest uh, Chile pigs, uh, salmon producers, um, and their focus is to seek out uh, the major challenges uh, in, in terms of global cultivated salmon um, in regards to human health and sustainability of the environment, social issues, and economics. Um, prior to this position, he was the Undersecretary of Fisheries for the country of Chile, his charge there was to organize something called a salmon table, in which they were tasked to meet the major crises that were uh, facing the salmon industry, many of those I think you will touch upon today in your talk. Uh, Mr. Sandoval is trained as a civil engineer, he got his degree at the University of University in Chile, uh, and he's here to talk to us um, today um, to share his insights about uh, his many years at both government posts and in the private sector and to talk about the global and local issues of uh, both the salmon industry and its regulations. So please welcome Mr. Sandoval. Chile, it's 5 p.m., so I don't know whether I should say good morning or good afternoon. I have about one hour to speak. I guess it will be a little shorter, but you never know. And I have the slides in English. And then toward the end, there are some slides in Spanish. So with with our interpreter we will try to fix that problem okay thank you very much i'm really grateful for your invitation i didn't know santa barbara it's one more city in the world that i can check that i know and it's also very beautiful i live in a neighborhood where people complain about big buildings in Santiago de Chile. So here they would all be happy. So they, they always want all the, all the services of the big city, but they don't want big buildings. But anyway, let's talk about fish. We're going to talk about the salmon industry. And what my main interest is the last, the very last slide which is the conclusions of our experiences. Because we're going to, I'm going to tell you about uh, what happens in Chile, but you are over here, and there may be a few people from Chile, but uh, the, your experience here is not going to be exactly the same. But what I think the main interesting point is that it's, this is a new experience, a new industry, aquaculture, and I hope you don't make the same mistakes with it. And that's the main conclusion that I want to leave with you. And that aquaculture is an activity that's different from what happens in the land. So before we start, let me start with an example. The Spaniards came to Chile 500 years ago. Pedro de Valdivia was the, the conquistador. So the Spaniards, no, it was not so much in Chile, but it was uh, all all over Latin America. They killed all all the indigenous people, and the ones that they didn't kill, they they were made slaves, pretty much, and they distributed the land uh, by force among the Spaniards that that came with him, and they created private property of the land, and that continues to be the rule. In the ocean, nobody has distributed the property. 
So if today Pedro de Valdivia came, he he could kill everyone that works in the ocean to distribute the property. So making productive activity in the ocean has the difficulty that you have to uh, make sure that everybody agrees so they can work into their different activities and work together. So you cannot kill everyone and, and distribute the, the, the ocean. So this is a new experience to have a productive activity in the ocean without doing it by force. And this experience happens both in, in fisheries as in aquaculture. So much in fisheries as with aquaculture. And also the ocean is a common space that in the land happens differently. In, in the land you can put a fence, but in the ocean you cannot really put a fence and the fish moves from one area to another. So in the ocean you cannot distribute the fish in the ocean. You can make quotas that you can fish in different areas. But aquaculture, what happens in one spot because of uh, ocean currents mm. is going to affect the other areas. So you can be a very good producer in aquaculture, but if my neighbor is not doing things right, I'm going to suffer the consequences of his, of his bad activities. So it requires that somebody administers this common, this common asset, this common good, and the state is going to, to uh, play a very important role. So I'm going, you know, moving ahead to my conclusions. But anyway, uh, we're going to talk about the salmon industry in Chile, uh, global vision and its perspectives. So this is not so much like this, but if we follow the trend in human population, this would be how it would, it would be the growth. And it's not going to be like this exactly because the the growth is not going to continue that curve, but we are the uh, human population, human world population is going to continue to grow. And on top of this, the middle class in the world is also going to increase with China's expansion, with the eruption of, of India in economic terms and also Brazil, which is another huge country. These are all countries that are going to grow. They are going to generate a new middle class with, with many more people. And that middle class is going to demand more food. And in our case, more salmon, which is a product that's uh, consumed by middle class people with a little higher income. So this is what we consume in vegetable protein, in animal protein and fish protein, and what the projection is. And as we'll see, this should vary. Because fish protein are better than animal protein, and in many cases better than, than vegetable protein which is going to be limited because, because people are using a lot of, of the land that could be used to produce vegetal protein. So this is going to grow. In 2050, it's going to be this part, which is fish protein, is going to grow much bigger than what's indicated here. So this is how the consumption of protein is distributed among fish, terrestrial animals, and other sources which would be vegetables, right? And this, uh, this is the reality in 2013. So there is a lot of room for growth in fish protein, as we're going to see, because they are healthier than, 
than some of the other sources, particularly uh, animal protein. This is the, the growth curve of consumption of different types of meat. We see how there is a, a steep growth in fish. These are the trends and estimates of how many kilos per person in the world that are going to be consumed by uh, uh, per person in the world of fish. So we see how there is a growing demand in in fish products. And what happens with fisheries? This is what fish, and this is the aquaculture in blue. The future of fish consumption is in aquaculture. Fisheries have been stable for, for a really long time. And it's going to be difficult to have those grow. If some of uh, you here protect whales are going to be mad at me. Uh, once I went to Japan and they gave me a little booklet about about the consumption of whales, and they said there is uh, 18 million uh, tons produced in fisheries all over the world, and whales consume about that same amount, about 20 million tons. So since whales are cannot be fished, uh, they are going to, to continue to consume so those fisheries are going to go down. So aquaculture is really the future of the consumption of fish. On top of that, if we look at the value per unit of every ton produced, it's much higher, that value is much higher in aquaculture than it is in fisheries. Fisheries, uh, that value could change in Chile, when the fishing law was modified and the industry was organized so that uh, so that fisheries were were ordained, there was less fish dedicated to to uh, other uses, and it was mostly used for for uh, as food. But in any case, uh, aquaculture is always going to have a higher value per ton produced now and in the future. These are the main species that are produced in aquaculture or in fisheries because these are both, uh, some of them are, are caught in fisheries and some of them are produced in in aquaculture. So we didn't include here the wild salmon. And also in, in the last few years, the production was also lower than it has been the, the traditional amount. Of all the species that are uh, produced in aquaculture. Here you can see the production now and what's happened in the past. Uh, with salmon, our point of interest, we are, uh, we are expecting what's going to happen with some of the other species. We have here mollusks and shrimp. shrimps, carps, and, and the tilapia, and catfish. But tilapia and catfish, I think that's a different, a different market. Uh, this is more a more a lower class consumption, whereas salmon is more middle class. Salmon, when compared to other species, 
uh, and compared with other kind of meats, has these these qualities. In 100 grams uh, of salmon, there are 231 calories, 25 grams of protein, 85 milligrams of cholesterol, and a very high content of omega-3 fatty acids, which is something that's highly desired. And if you see in this slide, one one of our one of our producers in the association also produces pork. And if you see here, when we do the food conversion, it's it's much more beneficial in salmon than in the other species. What is that food conversion? That means that for in salmon, you produce one kilogram of fish per every 1.2 uh, uh, kilos of, of feed that you give him. While with the other species, you need much more feed. So they produce more per unit of feed. And they also retain more energy. They retain more protein. And the, the edible yield, that would be what you can eat, actually. So the performance, uh, how much of the fish you can, you can actually eat. That would be 68% in salmon versus the other species that runs around 40 something, 46% for pork and 46% for chicken and 41% for cow. Uh, yeah, and you actually use 100% of the salmon, but the the other 30 something percent is used. Uh, it's used for for different uses. So all these elements, that's what society is going to demand in the future. They are more beneficial in the case of salmon. So you could put here any other fish not necessarily salmon, uh, but any other fish. But cultiv cultivating in the ocean generates food that is much beneficial, much more beneficial than uh, other animals that are grown in land. And maybe here in the US you can confirm that. But in developed countries, and we can when you eat a piece of salmon or a piece of pork, you are not just eating and enjoying the good flavor of the, of the product, but you also want to consume that there is a good environment and that the conditions that in which that piece of meat was created were, were good. And even now, when you ask, what do you prefer to eat? This that has a food conversion of 1.2 and that has this production or carbo carbon fingerprint, uh, people are going to prefer, to, to prefer uh, salmon versus some of the other types of meat. So we are not only talking about the food itself, but the other qualities that affect the environment and those are all beneficial with fish. So these are the places that produce salmon in the world. And it's very difficult to, to create other growing areas for salmon because salmon requires very specific conditions. So when you need fjords, you need certain temperature, so you are not going to see many of these places around the world. What you can see uh, with aquaculture is a tendency to, uh, to produce, to have aquaculture in land. It may be here in, uh, in the coastal areas. You can put uh, w water from the ocean in tanks, and then you control all the variables. You can control salinity, you can control temperature, and so on. And then in the long run, the, the process can be cheaper 
and be healthier. So if that is the trend that becomes uh, mainstream in the world, then uh, if we take it to the limit, each restaurant could have its own tank and its own aquaculture production. Uh, but if that doesn't happen, then these locations are limited and, and the production of these, which is in high demand, is going to be limited in the future. These are the areas where producers, producers uh, market their products. From Chile, for example, we sent to Japan, to the European Union, to the US, and to Brazil. From Norway or that area of the world, the Faroe Islands, they sent to the US, to New Zealand, to the European Union, and to Russia and other markets. Those are well-defined markets, and as you can see, we compete. All the producers compete for the same markets. The biggest producer of salmon is Norway. They produce about 1.2 million uh, tons per year. And then comes Chile with 800,000. And then other countries like uh, Scotland and Canada, like in Faroe Islands, with much uh, lower amounts. Between Norway and Chile, we produce about 80% of the world. Here is what I was just talking about. This is the Chilean production since 1980, and these are tons. Norway, since we have information, uh, and this is the rest of the world in green. The production in Chile uh, licenses were given out uh, in different locations, so there weren't there were different locations where salmon could be produced with very few requirements. And, uh, and the aim, with the aim of promoting production. So in Chile we said, okay, we want to, to produce aquaculture. So we want people to go out and do aquaculture. Let's make it as easy as possible to produce aquaculture and we're going to give them licenses if they ask us, if they request it. So at first there was very little production and as people became more interested, we more licenses were handed out. And this was maybe a good policy at the beginning, but since there is no limit, since there is a, a, a limitation, and as I was saying at the beginning, in the ocean, we we all live in the in in the ocean, and what happens in one spot can affect other areas. So this is what happened in Chile. So we we all these licenses were given in Chile, and people would put their their production areas in in different locations and there was no order. And in 1991, there was a law that was signed and for the first time, it regulated to some extent aquaculture and it defined areas where aquaculture could be, could be done and the government said only we can only have aquaculture in these areas in a not very scientific way. Uh, and there was some additional regulations, but in general, the system continued to be very hands-off, very free for, for producing and to uh, stimulate production. These were the regions where aquaculture was was happening in the in the southern in southern Chile, and the blue areas that you can see in these two maps 
uh, were the areas defined for aquaculture. So as you can see, and without much scientific knowledge, you know, they were all next to coastal areas, and in those areas, uh, there is the the ocean is not very deep. Uh, when aquaculture is better done in deeper areas, and and there are spots in all these blue areas. So all these spots that you can see in this map are in those blue regions. So. These are the the areas defined for aquaculture in in that at that time in 1991. In 2002, there were two new laws that were uh, sanitary regulations and environmental regulations for those that were producing or working in aquaculture. With a a big complaint from the producers. But still, these were regulations that were relatively weak compared to what was happening. And as you can see with production, what was going on in those two regions that I just showed you. Just to give an example, because I would like to to refer rather to errors that we made in the past rather than talking about the good things that we've done. Uh, in Norway, in 2007, Chile was producing about the same amount as Norway. And the production I that was happening in Chile in these two regions was being done in Norway in a region that was about twice as large as this one. So, uh, and so Norway being our biggest competitor was producing in a more s sparse way. In 2007, a big, a, a new virus appeared and it killed most of the production we produce three types of salmon, Atlantic salmon, coho salmon, and trout. And this virus that appeared in 2007 affected our main species, which is Atlantic salmon. And it expanded throughout the ocean and affected all these areas that we've seen. What were the main causes of this 2007? And now we are talking about, I'm talking about this 2007 problem because it was very important to what, to what we've learned. This was areas with high concentrations on sites, especially in region 10. Here is the highest production of salmon and the, the production locations were very close together. It was, it was highly concentrated, and it was high production per site. There was a lack of uh, management programs. We always say in the extreme that it was a self-regulated system regulated by uh, the, uh, the producers themselves. But the common good is not the sum of all the different goods of the individual good. And each, since each uh, company was looking for its own good, uh, when the disease appeared in one location, it soon uh, appeared or distributed to all the other locations. We were open to the, in to the import of eggs. So as soon as you finished the one crop, you would start with the production of the next one. 
and there was a lack of uh, sanitary regulations and sanitary processes. In Chile, there is a, a disease that cows have, and it's called Aftos fever. And there is a very rigorous control for the entrance of cows in the country so that Aftos fever doesn't penetrate the country. But with salmon eggs, there was no regulation. And most likely that this is came uh, in an egg that came from abroad. So we didn't pay enough attention to biosecurity, to biosafety. And we would also allow the movement of fish from one location to another in the ocean. And as you know, when fish move or when they are moved from one location to another, they get stressed. And when they get stressed, they catch diseases. And oftentimes, fish were moved from one production location to another. Nowadays, you can only move fish from the place where uh, they are uh, where the eggs are brought to the production facility. And also the government didn't understand their regulation. I've always thought of the extreme case, uh, salmoniculture or aquaculture of salmon. I would think of it as the American Wild West and some very successful Americans in the West. So they got there, they grabbed the land, the concessions, they were successful, and they told Washington, you don't have to do anything to give us any regulation because I'm very successful. You don't need to tell me how to run my business. And then the government in, in that extreme believed them. Until we reached the crisis. And that's, those are some of the things we've learned from this crisis. Okay, so not realizing soon enough caused this. There was a reduction in production of 50%, uh, 41% of direct and uh, job, job opportunities fell or were lost. Unemployment went up very sharply to 9.2% from 3.5% in those regions, but if we consider not just the, the jobs lost in this region, but in other regions that were also affected, then that unemployment would have grown more. And also the economy of the region fell by 19%. And this is in one of the, of the, regional, of the regions where production of salmon takes place. And this is the numbers, the figures in the other region because salmon in that part of the world, in, that in those two regions, in those parts of the country, are pretty much the entire economy of the region. Okay, so this was our first lesson. The production of salmon was done uh, in open areas where the production in one location can affect the production in others. So we all have to be watching each other. There is high connectivity in the system. The here you can see the currents. And we never, we never worried about the effect of those currents. Production locations, 
they were very close to each other. You can see here in this in this map how much they affected one another. There was uh, no separate areas. They were all mixed together. The red dots are production sites. And they're all mixed together. We didn't have uh, different regions protected from one another so that if there is a disease in one area, we can uh, put systems in place so it won't move to the other region. The effect of the distance when your neighbor got infected uh, would range between 7.5 to 10 kilometers and concessions in Chile are much closer than that. So lesson number two, salmon requires sound and science-based regulations that will take into account the complex environment interactions of the of the place or the locations where it takes place. So in Chile, there is quite a bit of science produced, but there, but it, there is no connection with the uh, with industrial production. So let me, with all due respect to uh, to uh, academics, but oftentimes we study very specific. Uh, studies, we do research about very specific things, but there is no link between university and, and enterprise. So then after the ISA crisis, crisis, we develop new regulations for the industry. And toward the end, we're going to, to learn the, the big lesson. Just leaving everything to being self-regulated can have a very high cost. So we improve the use of food, we improve the importation of eggs, and we regulate it uh, for vaccines and, and drugs. We modify the regulations, that the, the sanitary regulations, and we've developed specific programs for ESA, the disease that we that we suffered, and two new uh, diseases that we have today, the Calibus and the RSI, and those are two sources of uh, the U or for that forces us to use a lot of a lot of antibiotic in Chile. And they forced us to do a lot of uh, sanitary regulations. And then other topics that were also regulated, uh, all of these, they are, they are very basic. And today we move to the other extreme. You know, we went to having a lot of regulations, but it's normal that eventually we'll, we'll find the 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 medium or the the balance so the new salmon production cycle we have the entire cycle here from the eggs to the to the markets so we have the hatcheries the centers where we have the small fish before they get to the ocean and then uh, once in the ocean we improved transportation. We added biosafety uh, before crops, and then transportation went to the markets. So what did we do? You know that a tennis player that has already been playing for a while is much harder to teach than somebody that is brand new because uh, they, they've already been playing with all these little tricks that are very difficult to correct. 
So we had, in this case, we also had to work with a system that was already in place, that was already working, and we cannot eliminate all these structures. We cannot, we cannot uh, eliminate concessions. If they are already producing in one area, we cannot say, okay, you cannot produce there anymore. They already have a right. So now we said, le let's have uh, isolated areas. So there is going to be enough distance between concessions. So if there is a disease that appears in one concession, there is going to be enough of a buffer of a, an area around it, a distance that will not affect other concessions. But that requires a lot of time. And we also uh, said we need more regulations from the state. And in these areas, transportation should happen within each region. There shouldn't be transportation be between regions. So diseases won't move from one area to another. But that means that there should be infrastructure in place in each one of these areas or regions. So we need to have this uh, planning. So we will have all that infrastructure in place in the future. And within those regions, There is a management that's a common management for each one of those regions. And there is a mandatory following. Uh, and among other things, in the past, in the same production location, you could bring fish and take out fish and uh, any time and nowadays you ca you have to bring all the fish at the same time and take them all out at the same time so lesson number three there was a restructuring of the industry and, and because it was an established industry that restructuring is more challenging than, strat than starting from scratch. So we were already established tennis players, so now we have to start from scratch. There was one region when where we started from scratch. It's a new region where there was no production before. And in that particular region, things are much better now. Public and private cooperation is fundamental. You know, the Far West needed Washington, and Washington had to work together with the Far West. And information, scientific information and objectivity is, is very important. Okay, so after ISA, and everything that has been done. These are the new focus of ISA, of the disease. And with all those measures that we took, this you can see the production here and what the new focus of ISA have been. ISA is never eliminated, but it can be contained and we can work with it. And at least with with regards to this disease, all those new regulations and measures have been very successful. This is the production. As you can see, the w you can see the crisis here. And now we are even above what we produced before the crisis. Um, 11% is trout and 17% is coho and the rest is Atlantic salmon. So and remember that from these 808,000 uh, tons, we take about 60 something percent for human consumption. These are uh, the production of 
the production, the monthly production, and that has been growing, and now it's uh, stable. And I believe those 800,000 tons are going to remain stable for a while. This is, uh, these are the same figures for trout and production per month. They have gone down a little bit. There's been a problem with prices and the markets. And here are the figures for coho salmon. And this is a seasonal fish. And it's produced between September and March, but the peak uh, happens around uh, December, January, and we we use it, we produce it at three kilo. And this is the production uh, in price in 2013 and 2014. Here are the prices for trout, and the prices for trout have also gone down as with Atlantic salmon, and these are the prices for coho salmon, they have also gone down in 2014, and in 2015 both all three species have gone down in price a little bit. Th here is where export, where we export in 2013, 2014, and uh, in 2015. In the highest uh, import or importer is uh, the US, and then Japan, and then the European Union, and particularly Russia, and within Chile. Uh, in Chile, fruits are divided in in different types. Well, and we also uh, have to consider copper. Copper is the highest export of Chile by far. But then after that comes cellulose, and then and then salmon and and fruits. So salmon is up there with among the main exports of of Chile. Here is how uh, another disease has affected the production. Uh, it's uh, uh, the calibus, and the red, the red line uh, is the treatment that's done. And it has gone down in the lately. And this is the other disease, SRS, uh, for each one of the of the three species. These are the two main diseases that we have, the halibus and the, the, and the SRS. And here uh, is a slide in Spanish. These are the number of jobs, of direct jobs, uh, which are a lot of jobs for the regions where, where there is salmon production. So that's why it's the main activity. You saw how much activity, uh, economic activity went down during the crisis. 75% of the exports of the region where salmon is produced comes from salmon, and it's 88%, 84% of the exportation of the exports of, of uh, ocean products. And we also use quite a bit of the of the fish flour that we that we produce, and it's about 4.6 percent of the exports of the total exports of the country. And the unemployment rate is in the regions where there is aquaculture is 3.5 percent. Now I'm going to read for those that don't understand Spanish, what are our challenges nowadays? We have an, uh, a state, an institution that's very weak for such a, an important industry. So we continue to be in the far west and we need Washington to be more present. We need 
a better link between produ producers and uh, academia. And we need better infrastructure. We need ports that so we can separate the different areas. And we need roads. That's what we mostly need from the from the government. From our point of view, you know, from uh, what's our responsibility, we need to understand better the business. We need the biology of the business to have a better understanding of it. We need to understand also the relations among among neighbors. We are present in many places. We generate a lot of jobs. And we thought that we had done everything well in the far west. And when we realized that we had done something wrong, everything fell apart. And we hadn't been, we haven't had relationships with our neighbors. And now we know that we need to have those relationships. We need to invest more in, in having better knowledge. And we need to be able to point fingers. When somebody does something that's not right, we need to point that out, and that's not happening now. And from, uh, from the universities, we need to do more research, especially uh, directed toward production, and have a better transfer of that knowledge of that applied knowledge. Um, now I don't know if this is this slide is so important. It's uh, it's basically the same that I've said, but in in higher detail. It's also important the relations with the communities, and when it comes to jobs, we generate a lot of jobs. And one of the difference we have with our competitors in Norway is that we process almost everything in Norway, in, in Chile. So we, we have a lot of jobs, and there is we don't use a lot of technology. We use a lot of, uh, of uh, hand work. And we want to keep that as long as possible because that is a way of having a good relationship with the community. And here are more details about training and about uh, science. And now I've reached the conclusions. I think this is the last slide. And we could have spoken just about this. This is the most important point for me because since aquaculture is not very well developed in the world and that's our our future you know it's our food source of the future uh, aquaculture development requires that we learn from each other's experiences and at least i've come to tell our experience in coastal areas there are many activities, there happen many activities, and they all depend on each other. So any public policy that you want to develop uh, for productive activities in coastal areas, you need to take that into consideration. And you have to make sure that all the, that all the, act the actors are uh, are working together. For example, if I have a, a hotel here in Santa Barbara, in the coastal area, I'm not going to want to have a, a location of salmon production right next to it. And if the and if the authorities uh, authorize that, I'm going to complain against that because then uh, people are not going to want to come to my hotel. So somebody has to regulate that. In the ocean, there are people that are doing uh, uh, fishing activities. There are different uh, water activities. And there are different types of fishermen. 
and there is also recreation and there are there are ships and boats that uh, that pass and somebody has to regulate all that usually cities at least in my country municipalities they have to define what's called uh, uh, the regulatory map uh, or the the different uh, use zones or zoning and if you don't do that from my point of view the value of what's being produced in the ocean is going to be lower because I won't want to to produce an activity in the ocean if somebody else is going to be doing another activity that's going to affect mine. So there are people that say that the market can regulate that. So I will buy a big coastal area and I won't let anyone come into that area and I'll do my activity or I'll pay everybody else to get away. But I don't think, you know, I don't think that can really be implemented, especially because there are traditional activities that have been going on for a long time. So what should happen is that the government, working together with the communities, they define uh, different areas for different activities. We didn't do this when when aquaculture of salmon started in Chile, and since we are already tennis players, we have a lot of other players. That conversation is much harder to have now because we all have to play together. We have to give space to one another. So all th those conversations are much easier if they happen at the beginning. Ocean systems have high connectivity. So it, the uh, spread of disease uh, is, a, is a very challenging. So there has to be some regulation. So if you are working with living, uh, with living animals, you have to take all that into account. Somebody must define what is the distance, and there must be a scientific knowledge to decide uh, what those distances should be and where the licenses should be given. Remember the 1980s when the concessions started to, to be given out? There was no planning. And it's necessary to have a look to the future to see what's going to happen in the next 20 years uh, so we can do some planning of the coastal areas. And then before the end of those 20 years, in 15 years, you have to, you're going to have to do the planning for the following 20 years. That doesn't mean that the government is going to have to plan everything or control everything. They just have to make sure that they create the conditions for everything to, to happen peacefully. The government has this regulation role, a planning role, and the private sector has the role of producing and the experience so they can give that knowledge to the government in their regulation. The American Far West is not possible without Washington. It's necessary to have a regulation. The laissez-faire, the letting, letting everybody do what they want, uh, ends up being in not allowing the activity. And since we are an activity that has a relatively short history, Aquaculture has been around for for 
thousands of years. But aquaculture as production in massive production has been around for only 30 or 40 years. So we need to learn and continue to change those regulations as, as we learn. And we have to adapt to the new circumstances, and the new situations that are being created. So that's what I can say about our experience and tell you about what I would do differently if we started from scratch. Thank you. Hi, Don Felipe. Good afternoon. I have two questions. The first one is whether the vision that you've given us is representative of all the product, all the producers, all the salmon producers of that cooperation for the future. Does that represent all the salmon producers in Chile? And second, whether there are the spaces in Chile for currently in the industry create innovation in production within the industry, or if there is a possibility of working on that. I think that with, with in general, we share that those ideas. The crisis hit us all very hard And since today we all know that there should be some kind of regulation, so what happens next door doesn't affect me. But once you get there, uh, you just look at what's going to affect you directly. So you may have an emphasis on, on different things. But in general, I would say that there is a we share all, all that opinion about regulation. Uh, in general, uh, different companies, uh, uh, they innovate quite a bit. But I think in Chile, there are two things lacking that go beyond the companies. And sometimes we don't agree on how to do it. One is that there should be more research, more basic knowledge and then applied knowledge to find solutions that affect us. We need a, a vaccine in the case of SRS, for example, so we don't have to use so much antibiotic. But And we are working on a big project that was going to be financed by the industry, but then there were a lot of internal problems, and it's something that should do, the, the that the government should do. But and at one point, the government got in and said, okay, I'm going to do that. So and this is going to happen starting next year, and that's something very important. And the current government is favoring some production areas or sectors, particularly aquaculture, and production of salmon, and that's going to help uh, focusing uh, the research. Hi, Felipe. My question is, uh, today, with respect to Norway and their production capacity and their the spaces that they have to develop their aquaculture of salmon. If we compare our production, do you think that we are uh, at about the same? Well, we are we are in the same spot we were because in Chile we 
have the same concessions we had before the crisis in the same areas. Uh, uh, the whole thing about the American Far West has become very complicated because what we should do in Chile is increase the apt areas, the, the good areas, they should get bigger so concessions can be further away from one another so there is higher safety in the system. So there is uh, safety in transmission of diseases but in the history that we've had of communicating with the community, that makes it very difficult for the communities to accept that. Because that increasing the areas could be done administratively from the government, but nobody's going to want to get into that political problem with the people, with the communities, and we need some kind of consensus, and that's an area that we need to develop, and that's how why it's so important those dialogue with the people with which you have to, rel to have relationships. Hi, um, thank you very much for giving a nice talk about the current state of affairs of agriculture in Chile. Um, my question is related to uh, the previous question. Um, what's the goal of uh, Chilean government in terms of aquaculture production? Because that will really um, affect or will matter about uh, how you, you strategize or deal with, with like plans for aquaculture in Chile. Like, do you want to double it? That's your plan or something like maintain the current production or be similar with Norway? So that's that's my question. There is not a, a quantitative goal. In Chile, aquaculture is basically production of salmon salmonic culture and then after that uh, comes mussels that has been about 200 million dollars and then after that comes algae and other species that are even lower so that should about double about double in the next 10 years but the most important thing today is that in, s in salmonic culture is to consolidate well what we already have. So we have security, we have safety to grow from there without sanitary risks. Chile occupies uh, a small, a small part, part of its coastal area in in aquaculture and salmonic culture, so we have a great potential for growth, and we can produce other species different than salmon, but that development of other species will depend on the legitimacy, legitimacy of salmon industry for communities to accept that other species can be established. Hello. There is this dialogue that aquaculture is going to, to produce the necessary food for the future, but as you've said, uh, salmon is mostly consumed by middle class. So to what extent is aquaculture going to start generating food that's accessible for all these communities, for example, in Latin America that have no, no easy access to food? 
Well, there are other species like catfish and tilapia. Uh, catfish is mostly produced in Asia. It's catfish. It's a fish, I don't know, that's produced mostly in Asia. And it has very low, l very low price. And in Latin America, we produce a lot of tilapia, and there is uh, there is a, a possibility for growth. So we don't need to think or focus just on salmon, but other species of lower cost, but with good uh, nutritional values. I wanted to ask if in the expansion of the industry to the to the southern regions if there is a more systematic way of incorporating all these lessons that and the legislation that has been learned so we don't make all these mistakes again yeah in chile after the 10th and the 11th region there is a 12th region and we are developing aquaculture. It used to be very small before the crisis, uh, but it's grown uh, since the crisis. And we are developing aquaculture there with all the new regulations. And it, they are doing very well. So hopefully they won't have the same problems we've had in the more northern regions. Hello, Felipe. I wanted to ask you about how buyers see the use of, of antibiotics. You've mentioned the SRS, and we've seen in other talks the perspective of the buyer, of the consumer, with respect to the salmon, uh, wild salmon versus uh, grown salmon, and how does that work? Well, in Chile, we had bacterian diseases and to fight those you need antibiotics or a vaccine for SRS there is not a vaccine uh, that can fight that disease so we have to use antibiotics and the use of antibiotics generates a problem that I'll say it's more cultural and I'm going to explain why the final fish that's used for consumption, for human consumption, has no trace of antibiotics because none of the countries we export to would accept that what people are going to eat can have antibiotics. So we give antibiotics and then there is a period in which there is no antibiotic and that gets eliminated. So before it gets exported, there is no trace and there is no problem for human consumption. I understand that we should move toward a lower use of antibiotics, uh, if especially if, if we're talking about producing or having a product of better quality. Even if by the time it gets exported, it doesn't have antibiotic, but uh, we are working with the local authority in Chile, so we can improve management uh, or management uh, ways, and we can produce a vaccine, so we can reduce the use of antibiotics. And the other problem we have is that the situation in the U.S. is different, because here, it's if you invent a new product, you have a 10-year protection. In Chile, uh, there, is a there is a lot of copying uh, products, uh, pharmaceutical products that somebody else has invented. So there is no incentive to, to come up with those vaccines or solutions. So that's where us as an association are working on seeing whether we can establish a price 
for whoever can find a solution to this kind of diseases. Nowadays can be SRS, but in the future can be a different one. Because in our country, it's going to be very difficult to come up with a law that protects th those products uh, th produced li by laboratories. So we should uh, face the problem heads on. Besides that, there are laboratories that are developing vaccines. So they can be used in our country and there is the work being done by the government and there are uh, management measures uh, being taken to lower the need for and the use of antibiotics. Hi, thank you so much for your talk. Um, I had a question. You've spoken a lot about the need for the government to impose regulations on the industry to keep everything going well. And you were just talking about how the industry might lead the way with disease. And I was just wondering if there were other examples of opportunities that the industry has to maybe collectivize and self-regulate, and in what instances that might be more beneficial versus when the government is really needed for these roles. <laughs> Sorry. Um, <laughs> a little simpler. Um, I was wondering how much opportunity there is for the industry itself to self-regulate versus the need for government to come from the outside to impose regulations. I hope there is none. I hope or the only In my opinion, the only way we can have a self-regulation would be the following. That one company were the owner of all that area, and another different company was uh, the owner of all that region, and so on. Because those areas, and also, that in each one of those areas, a company had the production of everything that's been produced in that area. Because if in that area th there is one species that gets a disease, the because of the distance to the other areas, that disease is not going to move to any of the other areas. And also to have the infrastructure in, one in each one of those areas so we don't need or we don't allow the, uh, the, the disease to move from one area to another because of transportation needs. So we could say, okay, this is your ranch. This is another ranch. These are the ranches we have. You can do whatever you want in your own ranch. But since that is not going to happen, it's not possible, I prefer that there is no self-regulation. And in this case, regulation within a normal logic, without taking it to the extreme, is going to give more economic value to the, to the companies. Because if there is no regulation, I'm always going to have the fear that whoever is next to me is going to, to transmit a disease to my region, to my area. So my produc production risk will not depend just on what I do. So what we need is a state, is a government that can give us the guarantee that through uh, regulations and fiscalization, I will be able to produce that 
थ्री किलो फिश हेलो फिलिपे थैंक यू फॉर योर पेशेंस आंसरिंग ऑल आर क्वेश्चन माई क्वेश्चन इज यू हेफ मैंशन दैट द इंडस्ट्री इज वेरी इंटरेस्टेड इन अट्रैक्टिंग साइंटिस्ट एंड डिवेलपिंग अप्लाइड साइंस वाट आर यू डूइंग स्पेसिफिकली टू ब्रिंग ओवर नाउ और इन द फ्यूचर दोज साइंटिस्ट टू डू एक्सैक्टली दैट well what we have within our association there is a technologic institute that uh, collects information and learns from what's happening and we have a project that for us is a pretty large project and i've told you about about it earlier to face these two diseases the calibo and srs and this is not public so hopefully nobody of what nothing of what we say will go come out and together with the universidad catolica of chile we uh, planned this project that responds to to basic information because we need that basic information to come up with applied uh, and it responds to everything that the universities and sciences have not studied about these diseases and we reflected all that in 40 in 40 questions and that had a value of about 25 million dollars and that's what i mentioned that with all the companies together we decided to to finance this project and when the government saw that we were having problems among ourselves uh, they said that they were going to take over and do that because many of these questions are basic research which is also a, a role of the government some of those questions had to do with the development of of drugs maybe 25% so that part we are going to do and the rest uh, we are going to do in collaboration with the government so as organization of salmon producers and in parallel to that uh, national and international laboratories present in chile they invest a lot of money to also face this to these two problems also of srs and calibus and i think we are going to find a solution in fact uh, in the case of calibus we are already in the testing phase for some of the solutions and in the case of srs we are a little behind and finally what the government is going to do is once we've done this first part they are going to create this technological center to work on the calibus and the srs and their plan is that if this becomes successful this will become a center about aquaculture diseases so we have uh, that center that that will be working on aquaculture or sol uh, solutions of of problems around aquaculture you can imagine a, in a country like ours where the second producers of salmon in the world and we don't have a center like that so hopefully next time you invite me i will be able to talk a little bit more about that